Okay, while we're still waiting for folks to join, um, just can't resist the opportunity of having a DBT representative here on the call with us. So maybe we can poke Stefan for some insider info of any exciting features dropping or coming soon in DBT. Anything that you guys are working on that we should uh, or shouldn't know about? <laughs> Uh, I think one thing that gets me really excited um, is the unit testing functionality um, that the team is working on, and we're close to releasing that. Um, I don't know how many of you have used uh, a DBT in the past, but unit testing wasn't like a core functionality. You had to go via some, some open source packages to, to achieve that. Um, that's quite exciting. I'm, I'm very yeah, happy that we bring more best practices from software engineering um, to the data world. Um, so that's pretty cool. On the DBT cloud side, um, hmm, what could I say? I think uh, there was a major debate in, in the data community about our column level image announcement. Uh, I still think it's a pretty cool feature to have now, um, especially for enterprise businesses that, that rely on that stuff. Absolutely. Um, can you give a very brief description of what a unit test is or how, how you guys are implementing it? Yeah. So, um, DBT has like one of the strong sides of DBT is this idea of doing quality checks of your data. So you build some hypothesis, um, like is this column unique or is it not now? With unit testing, what we are trying to do is before we even write data back, um, you want to assess whether the business logic that you've put in, uh, that you've written in SQL is actually performing in the way you expect it. So um, I, I I don't see unit testing. Um, basically added to all your transformative steps in dbt cloud or in dbt but mainly for those that are very critical like where you have like a, a very specific type of business logic how you calculate revenue or discounts or whatever um this is where i see this like adding like another level of, of governance and um, reliability to your to your transformation and would it work similar to tests just something that you put in in the yaml exactly exactly that's how it's going to work um, so, um, you will put the mock data in there and, um, yeah, DBT will, will do the rest for you. All right. Sounds like we know which, uh, which features SQL DBM is going to support next. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's an actually good plan. I like the, I like the thinking. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we've, we've got quite a, quite a number of participants here, so we could probably get going. And let's start with a round of introductions, and then we'll we'll go through the the format and what we'll be covering today. So my name is Serge. I'm the product success lead at at SQL DBM, and I have with me Stefan Dury from DBT. I'll let him introduce himself. Hey everyone, my name is Stefan. Um, I work as a solutions architect here at DBT Lab. Um, yeah, very happy to be invited to this webinar talking about uh, DBT contracts and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, I'll be also in the chat if you have any specific questions around DBT, um, or at least I will try to follow. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Okay, fantastic. So for everyone on the, on the webinar, um, we're going to run through a couple of slides and we'll be mostly talking about uh, transformational modeling, the kind of modeling that DBT um, helps facilitate, and relational modeling, which is the main focus of SQL DBM. And we're going to see how the two are dependent on each other and how to actually bridge the gap and enforce one in, in the other through the use of DBT model contracts. So we're going to explain a little bit of how they work, what they are. We're going to run through a very simple scenario of a typical workflow of starting an analytical process in in relational modeling and then uh, generating dbt assets and transferring that over to the dbt project and we will leave some time for q a at the very end so you're free to ask questions in the chat we do have uh, some of our colleagues answering questions um, in the in the chat while we talk, but some of the more if the one if it doesn't get answered in the chat, we'll leave some some time at the end. And also, I will give a heads up that we have some some promotional items to give away. Um, my book, Data Modeling with Snowflake, 
is up for grabs and these are going to be given away randomly from people who participate in the chat so either ask questions leave a comment in the chat and a few of you will be randomly chosen i'm sorry i don't know how many but we have a few to give away so with that let's let's get going uh, let me share my screen and we'll start with We'll start with the slides and we'll work our way up to the example. Fantastic. And can everyone not see my presenter view window? Hopefully you should still be seeing the slides. Excellent. All right. So what are we going to cover today? Um, number one, why data modeling matters. Data modeling in, in all its formats and manifestations. And we're going to dive in specifically into what is SQL DBM and how the, the approach SQL DBM takes to relational data modeling. What is DBT and the approach that DBT takes to transformational modeling. And we're going to look at um, one of DBT's newer features, uh, model contracts, and help how they help bridge the gap between relational and transformational. And then we're going to see it all in action with a live example and a sample analytical scenario. OK, so what is data modeling? Um, everyone seems to have a very opinionated answer to this question, but we're going to try to look at this as objectively as possible. So a lot of times, you know, if you ask a, a, an analytics engineer what is data modeling, they'll just say it's what I do in DBT. You ask uh, some of the older generation of database architects, they'll say it's it's diagrams, it's these archaic um, legacy-based desktop things that you that add work to to a project. But we're here to to demonstrate that data modeling is actually a a conversation that happens in an organization in a business between data teams and your domain experts between the people who need and consume and use data and the analysts, engineers, data architects that help shape and deliver that data. So it takes many forms, which we're going to look at in, in this presentation. So it is both the structure of the data that we're looking at, it's the relationships of the entities that are involved in our data model. It is the logic that helps transform and create these uh, analyses or models. And it's everything in between down to the, the language, the terms we use, both technical terms like what is a dimension, what is a type one, type two dimension, what is normalization, to company and industry specific terms and KPIs, what is an active customer. All of these things facilitate communication and save time. If I, if both Stefan and I understand what an active customer is and the formula behind it, we don't have to then spend time clarifying or asking around, you know, what exactly determines if a customer is active or not. And to the people who say, we, we don't need data modeling, we don't do data modeling, um, as our buddy Joe Reese likes to say, a uh, lack of a data model is still a data model, albeit a crappy one. So if you're using data, you're, you have a data model. Your, your data has already been modeled. Whether or not that model is accessible, usable, understandable, clean, uh, correct, that becomes kind of a, a secondary afterthought. But problems related to data modeling are 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 numerous and I think if anyone spent any time in the data space they're familiar with with a lot of these uh, duplicate data um, incorrect data siloing uh, poor data quality uh, lack of trust uh, the inability to source and understand where data is coming from meetings uh, arguments iterations um, I, I know I'm, all of you on the call should be intimately familiar with these and the flip side of when you have an accessible, agreed upon, understandable uh, data model is, first of all, the consensus and visibility, not even into your data, but just the way your business operates, because data is just 
a byproduct. It's a reflection of what it is your organization does and cares about and measures. It's the reusability because your business doesn't change from project to project. Um, you're still talking about the business model of which the data model is based on. So reusability, accelerated time to market and analytics, self-service, effective utilization of data assets, and to make sure people are getting the full value out of what's being built. And back to common terms, common understandings. So cross-platform, cross-domain cross understanding of when people use a, a term, a KPI, they're really referring to the same thing and faster onboarding and shareability of all these things. So TLDR, time is money. And the less, uh, less time we can spend on finding things out, gathering requirements, asking around, self-serving, in other words, um, the more time we're able to spend delivering, focusing on what's important, delivering and bringing content and data to our end users. And as we like to say, modeling is a team sport. There is, in any significant size organization, there's just absolutely too much for any one person to keep in their head. No one can know it all, no one can do it all, no one can know it back to front. And oftentimes the conversation of data modeling is kind of confined to what is uh, the extent of the data team. So it is the framework, the ingestion of what do we bring into the data warehouse and then maybe the analyses we, we run on this. But as we're gonna see in this uh, example, it really starts with the business itself. What we do, do we sell products, do we stream concerts uh do we what are we and based on those questions that's gonna determine what are our entities which are our dimensions where do they meet and where where do they transact into facts and then which of those data points do we care about so we have customers and a customer can have an infinitely many amount of attributes from location address to favorite color some of them will, we're going to want to capture some of them might not be as relevant and then the the overarching landscape of where that data falls and then the types of analyses that we we run on this and of course the metadata around everything quality logs and <clears throat> Here, there's it's a simple org, uh, example of the same view of the same data set that seen from, from Snowflake in this case, or it could be any database. Typically, when you log in, you have the database schema hierarchy. You have schemas, and then you have objects underneath. There's really not a lot of nuance to help you navigate and understand this. So this is, again, a simple example and a pretty cleanly named example, but even with less than 10 tables here, it would take some time if uh, if there wasn't a body of documentation and a data model sitting behind these tables to help us understand exactly how these things actually form to, to paint a bigger picture and how do they relate? How do we join them? How do we build analyses? and how the business operates because again the fact that a customer makes an order that's not determined by the data team obviously that comes from the very nature of of our organization so it's very important to have a simple way of auditing understanding and and fact checking all of these things because a lot of times these assets are created with the help of the more technical teams but they still depend on somebody less technical, a business expert, um, validating and, and sense checking what it is that we're building. Because if this is not correct, then any analysis that we run, any type of join we do on these tables is gonna be, is gonna produce incorrect data. So um, to quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, there needs to be but one, one wise man in a company and all are wise. So rapid is the contagion, which is a fancy way of saying, once you've seen a better way of doing something, you wouldn't go back and do it the the stupid way, essentially. Um, once you've been exposed to best practices, you 
you tend to rely on them instead of going back to not knowing or not having. So in this example, we're going to start talking about the two types of data modeling that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. So there's the entities and the facts, the dimensions that we work with and the relationships between them. And then there are analyses that we run on top of them. So in this example, we have a person entity, an account entity, and then we have some kind of analysis, age account type, age analysis, which gives us account type, age decade, total account. But what what is this? What is it even telling us? Whose age? How are these things calculated? It's very hard to tell this information from the relational model. Um, if I was already expert, if I was the the analyst or the architect working on this project, I might have this information of, oh, this is this is people, these are bank accounts, there's a checking and savings account, and we want to know uh, which uh, which people are opening which type of account by by age. So, are young people opening savings account or not? But here we kind of have two separate unknowns. Uh, to build this analysis, I need to have the top picture, and to understand this analysis, I, from the top picture, I also don't have the lineage. I don't have the dependencies. So that's an incomplete picture of um, analyses and the entities underneath. So what age account type age analysis actually is, again, could be expressed as, as simply as the logic used, the SQL used to create this analysis. And here, again, it's clearer if you're willing to spend the time and understand what the SQL is doing. But what we really need is, is this. At a high level, to understand what happens within an analysis, it's a DAG, a lineage diagram of what exactly the intended purpose of this is because not everyone's going to have the time to spend analyzing SQL. And as far as SQL goes, this is a relatively short one. So much simpler to see inputs, um, joins, outputs, and then dive into the logic if, if you need to. Um, so this example is taken from SQL DBM. Uh, DBT, as, as Stefan said, is also working on column lineage coming soon, which just highlights the importance of being able to, to trace data flow end to end, which we'll again be looking at later on in this presentation. So what we really need is both pieces of the puzzle. Uh, once we're asked to do an account type analysis, we need to understand where the accounts are, who we're analyzing, how do we join these entities in order to perform the analysis, and then the rest becomes easy. The rest becomes SQL, logic, everything that we're already familiar with. And specializing in transformation and that type of modeling is, I, I could ask for, for no better um, partner than a representative of, of DBT. I've used DBT myself in, in my previous role as a database architect. So I'll hand it over to Stefan to explain exactly how DBT takes, what approach DBT takes to transformational modeling. Thanks, Serge. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think you can just jump right into the next slide because I will I will start with a little bit of, um, let's say, uh, it's not a history lesson, but basically um, the, the reason why DBT became so popular is because uh, while we had like such a, technological advancement on the on the storage and compute side, um, one fundamental problem in analytics teams uh, remained unresolved. And this is, um, I think, to search points earlier, uh, usually data is hooked up by a lot of, of, of chefs, right? Like you have the data engineers, but you also have somebody on the business side who, who understands like um, what defines what our business is doing, et cetera. And usually these were quite separated in, in, in a lot of um, these organizations. Um, technically speaking, in the past, um, uh, about you know transformational uh, modeling, um, so when you jump to the um, uh, to the next slide, it was pretty hard for business people to even understand what, what's going on in the data platform. 
because the data engineers they were managing things normally in in like store procedures and um yeah you needed a lot of technical uh, know how um in order to understand um how these things work together um not to mention that it was oftentimes more easy to just rewrite the store procedure for a particular use case there was no uh you know modern best practices that we know from the software world like dry code modularity etc um and i think dbt became so popular be because we tackled that exact problem and we became uh, we became loved by most of the of the roles um in the um yeah in in, in data teams um and they love us for very different reasons um so when you jump um we can start i'm today in in, in the demo, we're going to focus on the kind of the architect, right? Like the person who thinks about the data model um, in SQL DBM terms, um, but then wants to get to this uh, trend, uh, uh, the transformational process. We want to go from an ERD to a DAG um, as presented just by search. But um, it's also then the data analyst that all of a sudden become interested because um, development be becomes much more easier when I don't have to write all that boilerplate code. Um, with create table or like um, incremental logics um, that are now just very nicely abstracted um, by DBT down to the actual people who use your, your um, dashboards or reports in the organization. Because with DBT, I can give clear signals to those people whether my data quality checks are working well, whether my documentation is up to date. Um, so, it, uh, so it becomes a much more, like it becomes less of a black box and much more of a collaborative space um, for everyone else. Um, yes, so when we do all these things, what we end up with, um, search is, is, is that the picture is not that as chaotic. We, we arrive in a world of, of clarity and, 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 and consistency where we are able to explain the things that happen within our, um, uh, within our, uh, uh, data platform. Um, DBT has a, a wide range of, of, of feature sets. One of them we're going to talk about later, um, about contracts, but I think the main points that you that you should uh, take a look at when you start with dbt is the way how dbt helps you with with developing transformations because everything is kind of boiled down into a into a select statement which allows even analysts to to pick up um the dbt work um if you're willing to um we help a lot with um, reducing the downtime um in your systems by you know, we have uh, a great testing framework. I spoke earlier, we're going to add unit testing later on to that, um, uh, to that armory. Um, you are, you're able to do very nice CI CD type logics, um, and have that complete dependency management. And then last but not least, um, while the consistency is uh, important, it becomes explainable for people in the data team to, um, very much showcase how we are computing active users in a month, in a week, uh, across certain segments and cohorts because everything is documented and testing. So your dashboards show the same number and everybody in your organization can access that type of documentation. Um, I work at DBT Lab, we do both. We maintain the DBT core um, side of things and we also have a product that is called DBT Cloud. This is usually um, where I help big enterprise uh, customers to, to, to run DBT at scale. Um, it works uh, on top of your data platform, um, just showcasing that on the next slide, um, that basically this is where, where we see DBT fit, um, search on you, exactly. So when you see DBT fit and DBT cloud, it's this kind of um, additional layer on top of your data platform that connects both your um, your data sources and what's happening in, inside your data platform to, to, to the actual business. Uh, can you um, just... Um, as SQL yeah. DBM, a lot of times we get questions even from people of uh, what's the difference between DBT Core and DBT Cloud? Is a certain feature supported mm -hmm. on DBT yeah. Core as well? Yeah, for sure. Can you yeah, can you just, uh, click to the next slide? That was my the the, oh. the, the last slide I'm I'm, I'm going to show sure. today. I think when you once you run exactly once you run DBT uh, transformations. Um, you all you realize how much other things you need to take care of to have it at a in 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 a in, in a steady state, right? Um, productive workloads are not the same thing as running DBT run on your local machine. You need uh like uh much more around that around observability, maybe deployment capabilities. Um, and DBT Cloud is that um is that uh, additional feature set that that basically elevates the DBT protocol because in DBT Core you get all the we call com compilation logic um 
but you get much more on that on top. Um, we have a mini data catalog that allows you to do column level limits now that um, allows you to, uh, to do um, basically C dependencies, not within a single DBT project, but multiple projects because DBT, I don't know who in this in this group is maybe doing data vaults, but DBT projects can grow very fast. Um, and all of a sudden you maybe want to scale via having, you know, separation um, and like more domain specific separation in your DBT code. And this is kind of the stuff that we want to help with with DBT Cloud. If you're a team of one, two, three people, go with DBT Core. It's, it's the best in class thing that you can do. Once you need to scale across an organization, I I, I can speak from experience. I can highly recommend looking into, into DBT Cloud, but that's enough marketing. Let's uh, jump into the, in, in into sure. contract. Sure. Yeah. And most um, important, that everything that we're going to show today is compatible even with core, correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, exactly. So quickly, what we're going to talk about is contracts and contract is actually like a sub, sub feature or, or a sub um, functionality around the release we had with DBT core 1.5, which, which we call a model governance. Um, to my point of having like a more, uh, I think data mesh is a, is a term that is used often these days, but let's just think of decentralizing uh, your transformational modeling logic and in, in, you know, more domain specific areas. Um, we needed to come with an answer of how we would allow for consistency um, in those kind of data models that are supposed to be shared um, across these projects. And contracts are one very substantial part um, where we can basically guarantee the shape and the integrity of a, of, of a schema of an object that we may want to share with others in the, in the company. Um, and then the way to share these is by um, allowing for certain um, access rights. Um, they can be public, they can be uh, um, kind of grouped into, you know, uh, more uh, private uh, kind of groups of models. Um, but um, yeah, last but not least, if, if you ever needed to change a contract, which is a very rigorous way of looking at, um, um, at your data object, uh, we also have now the support of managing uh, multiple versions of the same table. So if I have like a dimensional customer table and I'm changing uh, the shape of that, instead of uh, redeploying, I could just run two versions in parallel. So it very much adopts more and more of these best practices that we know from, from software engineering. Like, uh, let's say analytical models as APIs almost because you're gonna call a v version v1 or a version v, uh, v2 depending on which shape you need from uh for the data. Um, yeah, uh, do I, have, I think I have one more slide just specific to contract. Yeah, so with contract, what what we are doing is um, we are adding that 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 governance layer on on uh, with regard to the shape um of of the data. So um, what we're going to see in, in the demo is how we're going to, you know, make sure that all data types, all um, constraints that we have defined and that we're going to get ba basically informed on from, from the SQL DBM side, how we're going to enforce them um, with DBT. But I think it's better to showcase that in the demo. <laughs> so uh, back to you, uh, Serge. Okay, fantastic. So for the next part of this uh, webinar, um, Stefan and I are going to to role play and we're going to assume our traditional roles, me as a data architect, Stefan as an analytics engineer, and we're going to work on, there we go. We're going to work <laughs> on a very simple uh, model or analysis. And we're going to see how, how to use both types of modeling, transformational and relational together, working in unison to ensure a correct and um, quality trusted outcome. So we're going to dive in, but just to highlight some of the, the pieces that we're going to be seeing, we're going to be looking at uh, relational modeling in SQL DBM, transformational in DBT, just to help you familiarize with some of the screens that you'll be seeing. Um, SQL DBM is an online database modeling tool. So just like DBT, um, cloud is an online transformational tool. And it means that it's accessible from anywhere, any platform, any browser will will let you model and share uh, to anyone in the organization. Uh, both are SaaS products. <clears throat> so in our case, we we host all of your model assets and version controls and number of projects. That's all 
unlimited and hosted by us in, in DBT. Um, they use uh, Git integration, so same thing, unlimited storage and iterations and version control through Git. Um, relational modeling. So a lot of times, again, mainly due to the some of the legacy tools that were clunky, install base, limited, siloed, stale, et cetera. Relational modeling is best when it's accessible and when it becomes a, a team sport, essentially, that everyone can see the latest version, they can search and navigate, they can self-service and discover, they can integrate, embed, uh, filter, contribute. So we're not going to get a chance to see all these screens and all these features. We're going to be focusing on our use case, but just to kind of highlight the fact that relational modeling in the modern BI stack could be a, a huge boon, as we're going to see in, in accelerating time to market and ensuring quality. Um, column view lineage, which again is also part of the tool, um, which we looked at earlier just to highlight that an important part that is going to be accessible in, in both tools as well. And documentation and governance, uh, highlighting this just because the fact that our um, some of the DBT properties that we're going to be maintaining, we're going to be maintaining them through our database documentation screen, which was kind of the natural fit for, for these types of elements. So just so folks understand why we'll be working on multiple screens, both using the search and relational ERD diagram functionality, as well as the DB documentation where our DBT properties live. So governance also includes other custom fields, which could be included as DBT meta columns and, and all of the DBT supported properties as well. Um, there's also pages and, and reports, but I don't think we're going to get a chance to see those live. Um, let's, without any further ado, get to our our example. <clears throat> so let me switch over to SQL DBM. And what we're going to be doing is we are going to be doing an analysis, building an analysis. And oops. And we're going to be doing a very simple one, just so everyone can can get a feel for the parts involved, which is a customer loyalty points program. So, a business um, business colleague or domain expert came to the data team and said, "I need a a new type of analysis that I'm going to use." to calculate the order volume of our customers and reward them with loyalty points for our, our frequent shoppers. And as a, a, a requirements, as a business user, they will come typically knowing the data, but not necessarily knowing exactly where the data is, both in the source system or in the data warehouse. Uh, so they may be able to point you to what they need. They may not. In this case, um, the user has just come to me and explained to me the logic of um, there's a certain formula of like you add up the total order volume and then you divide by, let's say, 10,000 and that equals points. And I also want to give them a medallion status of by category. So the, the top... Uh, Third will be gold, the middle will be silver, the bottom will be bronze. So now it's up to me in a as in a typical scenario to go and do some detective work of where is our customer data? Where is our order data? How do I join them? Um, are they cleanly named? Where is the where is the total order price? Do I need to take taxes into account? All of these things. Imagine I was a new developer off the street. I just started in the company. Where do I get this information? So because we are a data-driven company and we take data modeling seriously, we have already a project that uh, I've been given access to to leverage as part of my, my work. So the project has, uh, it's separated here into subject areas just for demo purposes. 
just so you can follow along with the example. So in a real case, this might be multiple projects, depending on how many teams and um, databases and source systems that we're working with. But at some level, I already have an ERD of our source system because our team has built it and maintained it. Some of you might recognize these tables. This is Snowflake sample data. And you can follow along with these examples if you want to. And using this, I can already get an understanding of what our entities are, how to find them, how to relate them. Um, I can search for, for customer and So let's go ahead and look at customer. That's this one. So I can highlight the relationships to sales order and location. So I can understand already what I'm going to need. If it's not in the warehouse, I can I can ETL this data across and, and start doing the analysis already having understood the attributes and, and the relationships. So already saving me a, a bunch of time um, instead of me having to ask or organize meetings around this. So in the next step, whether or not it's it's already present or we get our engineering team to set up a pipeline so I can get this information, um, I organized my project sort of by, by layer. So we have source, we have uh, the, the raw layer. So this is when I ETL, I might even lose some of these relationships during that process, depending on which tool I'm using. I might have a stage environment or schema where I have done a little bit of data cleanup, but essentially um, reestablish those same relationships. Um, SQL DBM actually supports uh, both physical constraints, which is what you what you see here, and virtual constraints. So if you didn't want this to be part of your DDL, uh, when you're building the staging layer or uh, forward engineering this to your database. Um, most data platforms support, uh, cloud data platforms support constraints. Uh, most of them also don't enforce them, which is uh, often interpreted as, you know, if they're not enforced, then why do them? But the answer is self-service metadata and, and, and usability. So having this uh, relationship in our diagram helps us understand what we're building, helps other tools, BI tools, for example, infer joins. Uh, if you're using uh, Snowflake with join elimination, you can even avoid joins using the, the constraints. And otherwise, we could do this um, manually. So if we didn't want to create physical constraints, we can create virtual and they work in SQL DBM the exact same way. They just don't generate and don't reflect in, in the DDL. And the most important thing before we get down to building code is the fact that it's, it's an online tool meant to be used by everyone, not just me, the data analyst, but I can take this. And if I was still unsure, I mean, imagine the names weren't as, as clean as they are here. I can bring this simplified model to my business and say, does this make sense? Does a customer have a relationship with sales order? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe we need to traverse a, an intermediary table. So at this level, it's a view that someone or anyone can can work with and understand, even if they they might be flustered by something a little more technical like this, we can, we can collaborate basically on, on any level of uh, communication and both uh, from design to uh, working bottom up or top down. So we can start with a simple design and, and iterate and expand it, or we can take an existing design and simplify it for viewing. So I'm going to start an, an analysis. So as we said already, we have our staging layer, we have customer and sales order, and this is what I'm gonna be building. And let's go ahead and pretend I was doing this from, from scratch. So I'm going to be building loyalty points. So I would start again by sourcing and finding uh, where are my, my customer, my sales orders. I can see from the table where the relationships are. And I would now create a new table. Let's call it 
loyalty too. I'll just be working quickly. Based on what my customer has told me, I know I'm going to be assigning these to our, our customer. So I'm going to need customer ID. So this could be independent. This could be an actual child of customer. So let me use a physical relationship. Oops, that's sales order. So we have customer ID. We have points amount, which is, um, let's make this an integer. And we have medallion, which we're going to make a bar char, as we said. So the reason I'm doing this instead of just going and writing SQL is because I want to make sure conceptually that what I'm building makes sense. So just like we said, we could have spoken to our business earlier to find the sales table, to find the customer table, to understand how they link up. I can do the same thing with the analysis that I'm going to be building, because this, as you saw, took me three seconds. Writing the SQL required to, to do this analysis is going to take me considerably longer. So it's in my best interest to spend a little bit of time and then just show this to my business stakeholder and say, based on your requirements, this is what I heard, this is what I understood, and this is what I'm going to be developing. Does this make sense to you before I go off and waste a whole lot of time on something that may not be conceptually accurate? So as part of this process, let's say the business stakeholder confirms these, uh, these columns, the structure, I'm just about ready to hand this over to Stefan so he can build the logic. But how do I ensure that what he builds, again, I've already confirmed this part, how do I ensure that his logic matches these three columns, these data types, the formulas, um, the answer is using dbt properties. So a lot of the things that I'm going to be handing over to him, I can, instead of sending it in an email or meeting him for lunch and talking over the, the water cooler, I can put it in a predefined systematic process that uh, dbt, thankfully, has already established called YAML, and model properties and source properties can all neatly be fit into YAML. So we're going to go to DB documentation where SQL DBM has made it easy to maintain um, uh, descriptions and comments. And because we have this sort of object column uh, and property screen, we thought this would be the perfect place for DBT properties. So any DBT properties for sources and models are are here. It's actually, it's not a huge list. And we can add them to our screen, things like freshness, things like tests. And just like descriptions, we can edit them here. And most importantly, a lot of these things, because they tend to follow a very similar pattern, so freshness, for example, it's really just the parameters that are changing. Um, these have a special property that we can define the input template. So just the skeleton around this object, where once I go, let's say to this one that doesn't have a, an entry, I can add the template and then just fill in my values, saving me time, making sure that the, the YAML is properly formatted. And likewise for tests for and for other properties that we're going to be maintaining. So I've already gone ahead and and done this for our sources and for our our model. So let me just show you what it is I've I've assigned. So this is for sources. I've already filled out the freshness. I've added some some tests and for for loyalty points. Same thing. I have I've added an accepted values for that medallion level test. And most importantly, let's go ahead and add model config, where I have added a very important piece of information, which is contract enforced true. 
So what does this look like when we save it and generate it as, as YAML? So let me save my, my project. As I mentioned, um, we have sources, we have models. Uh, Stefan will explain what each one does. But let's go ahead and not take loyalty too. Let's go ahead and take loyalty. So we're going to be generating YAML. And because we're going to be generating a data contract, we also want to include data types and constraints. So all of that information from the previous screen, descriptions, columns, data types, uh, is now embedded into this YAML, as well as all of the tests that I, as a data architect, have already outlined and also included here. So things like not null, uh, accepted values are coming across. And now I can check this into Git, in which case uh, we've already prepared the example. We're not going to waste time doing that. So I'll just hand it over to Stefan to continue. Let me stop sharing to continue the process once he receives this file. And his job is going to be basically to build the logic and to build this analysis. Yeah, thanks, Sersh. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm now putting my data, I'm an analytics engineer head on, um, and I've been tagged in a pull request um, from, from Sersh. Um, hey, you're the, uh, you're the uh, engineer working on this new uh, big customer loyalty project. Well, the most important thing is please ship this by tonight. <laughs> And um, what he has permitted is uh, <laughs> it's just the um, the YAML that you've seen uh, him generate earlier on, right? So he has committed this YAML, and now I can jump into my um, into either DBT four or DBT cloud. In my case, I'm going to jump into DBT cloud um, and check out that pull request. So I'm already checked out on this on the feature branch um, at loyalty table. I have the YAML here for me. Um, dbt only works with version control there's no way to use dbt without any version control i think i saw a question in in in, in the chat in case like these uh, yamas change over time you will you will maintain a, a history of of those yamas in, in in git um for now since i'm starting developing i'm going to um remove the 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 enforced um because i'm going to go through a lot of iteration and um, yeah, now we start developing dbt. So we're going to create a new file, um, which is going to be called loyalty, uh, loyalty .sql. This is basically defining the name of the object in my in my Snowflake. Um, so Serge has pointed me to name that model loyalty points. So I'm giving it the same name. Um, and we're going to start, um, you know, writing SQL. We will put in the business logic as defined. Probably at this point in time, I would reach out to to the marketing team. Like, how do you envision those those uh, those medallions to be defined? Um, so we are we are we are defining this together with the business. But what's very important with DBT is that everything that I do here is basically running like writing a select statement. This is this is as much code as I need in order to operate um, an object with DBT uh, on top of my data platform. So um, I will save this for now um, and hit the preview button. Um, and um, you see, like I'm sending this query into, into the Snowflake and I'm looking, okay, customer ID, medallion level, like everything looks fine. Um, let me reinforce the contract because now I want to operate that model actually in my Snowflake. Like I just hit preview, it sends the SQL um, when I hit dbt build, like this build button, it actually tries to materialize um, that statement into a, into a view or a table object in my Snowflake. And um, thanks to the, to the work that, that Serge has done, like doing all the detective work and specking out uh, those contracts, um, I see that dbt actually fails. Like it cannot persist um, that query um, on, on, on my Snowflake. And um, I can open up my run history um, and scroll down and see that um, I'm violating I'm violating the contract and it's telling me that um, there's a column customer ID and I've I've basically casted it in the wrong way um, so there's a data type mismatch um, I uh, I have a column location ID like pro probably I was thinking already one step ahead and 
thinking about joining this uh, and, and segmenting this across countries or, or nations. Um, but this was never defined in the contract as a column. So it's basically pointing me to, um, uh, to that violation. And then the point amount um, that I was actually supposed to put in was missing in the, in the SQL definition. So now I can jump back into my SQL and try to understand what I've done wrong. So first thing I've done wrong, of course, is um, this uh, customer ID. Um, then um, I've added this location ID, which was not needed. So I'm going to remove it. Um, and um, yeah, I've out commented actually the, 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 the point amount. So with these few changes, let's see now if DBT would accept um, the the um, the creation of my um, of my SQL statement, and in fact, it does it does it does build now a table model. So maybe for those who are completely new to DBT, like how does uh, DBT um, like uh, what is DBT doing under the hood? Basically, it's taking my select statement and wrapping it. Um, into uh, into the necessary DDL or DML, um, dependent on what I configure um, on this uh, on this object. So I can configure views, tables, but there's a, a wide range of other um, of other materializations that you can that you can use, like um, for slow changing dimensions, for example, or for incremental or delta loading logic. Like we 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 offer a wide range. But everything boils down into a select statement plus some added configuration. Um, another amazing idea, uh, thing with DBT is that um, we are leveraging Jinja templating in order to bring some dynamics into our SQL um, uh, into our SQL code. Um, so in this case, for example, I'm using this this referencing um, uh, macro in order to point to a specific table, right? So search was indicating to me. Um, hey, this is this is coming from staging customers, and and you need um, the sales order data. Bring them together and compute that analysis for me. And uh, with that ref statement, what 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 DBT all of a sudden understands is this procedural dependencies, like this transformational log, uh, uh, modeling, as we call it. Because in this analysis, we are joining staging customers and uh, staging sales sales orders into this loyalty points analysis. But the loyalty points analysis has no relational, um, let's say, uh, no relation technically uh, with with the sales orders, right? Because, um, yeah, it's just passed through because we are calculating something with it. Um, yes, so I've now, um, I've now built built my, my my model. What was great by Serge is that uh, on the fly, he already kind of went one step ahead and defined some tests for me. Um, so as an analytics engineer, I didn't even have to think about anymore about what types of tests are suitable for this data. Um, so he added those like a little accepted values test that would just verify that the values in my medallion level are um, either bronze, silver, or gold. Um, a little not null test. Uh, on top of the uh, on top of the constraints um, and the uniqueness test, and yeah, this is uh, like a little kind of demo into how data contracts can enable this type of collaboration between um, yeah relational modelers uh, in that case search um, and me like the analytics engineer who is caring more for the for the transformational logic. I would probably now maybe add a um, couple more things here, like I could. Could add other properties or um, add more tests, you know, because I I understand that there's maybe an, uh, a a necessity for something else. But even like that, how it is um, in DBT Cloud, it's very easy now to to commit my changes and saying um, add new table and run back into the Git process where I then it can tag uh, search back and he can then check out my 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 transformational work. So I'm gonna create a pull request that takes me back. Um, everything is version controlled. Um, and so we're adding this new table here. And now we have two files committed. One, uh, the SQL statement that we need in order to, to do the transformational work. And then the uh, YAML that is representing, um, yeah, the, the foundation from the, from the relational side. Um, yeah, that gives us five minutes for Q&A search. <laughs> it's trying to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was fantastic. We, we covered a lot in, in a short amount of time. And just to to wrap up what we were what we were seeing with uh, on Stefan's screen, um, he's he's handed it back to me. But really, the 
the unsung hero or the the main um, beneficiary of all of this is that business user, the imaginary business user who came to me initially and asked for this analysis. So it means that what they receive in their final dashboard or in the final screen that they see at the, rest, the end of our deployment or release is exactly what they described to me. So we would have caught it much earlier than than Stephen having to even go and, and write the code, me having to go and design the, the final shape of the data and just avoiding the iterations, the complaints, the tickets, the the maintenance involved in in repairing something that we could have just gotten right just by facilitating the communication we have among our business um, business users. And yeah, with that, let's go ahead and let's just wrap up really quick with some, share my screen. There's just one more slide to get through, which is upcoming functionality and future enhancements. Um, so Stefan mentioned a couple from DBT that I think are, are very exciting. And with SQL DBM, obviously if they release them, we'll have to support them. That goes without saying. <laughs> and one of the other things that we're in the process of starting now is, um, everything that we just did here, like this loyalty points. So we started with a relational model. It became then a transformational object. So next step is how do we identify this? So this is no longer just some table. This is a DBT created model. So as our next trick, we are we have a couple of, um, of enhancements that are kind of captured in this. Uh, one of them is integration with, with Git for DBT. So we already have Git integration uh, for our relational assets. And we are also going to add the ability to basically user maintain where is your uh, relational repository and where is your Git repository. So right from my project, I can send that YAML off to dbt. And once we have that link, what we're also going to do is pull from dbt. So we're going to take the, the manifest and we're going to label and identify those tables those models that are coming from dbt so users understand that this is this is dbt maintained that they shouldn't just be adding a, a column here and expecting to alter the table they need to do that through the dbt model so i'll stop sharing and let's go ahead and answer some questions from the chat um q a so there was a couple of oh, questions your and diligent already with a couple of those let's see yeah yeah our, our team is our, is uh is very active here but can we i mean you kind of covered this already a uh, difference between tests and model contracts and unit tests and mm -hmm. there was a question around yeah. referential integrity which of those options would be the best to enforce referential integrity yeah so for referential integrity um there's a like built-in test that is called relationship but these data quality tests, they they always run post writing to the database, right? This is the this is the big added value by contracts because DBT is trying to assess the integrity before I'm even writing data into um, uh, into the data model. So the same is going to be with unit testing. Both unit testing and contracts act before DBT builds the model. Data quality tests are like after I've written my data, um, checking for, for, for the quality um, of, um, of the rows. Okay. Uh, there were some questions around naming conventions. So things that start with STG underscore. Um, oh yeah. Do you want to tackle that? Is, is it, <laughs> yeah, is, so, is it um, a must or is it just a best practice? No, exactly. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a must. It's a, um, it's a, it's a best practice. Usually we see like three, uh, we recommend three, three layers um, in, in your transformational uh, modeling, um, starting from um, uh, staging. So this is basically, you have your raw sources that you expose with DBT, and then you stage these, that's the STG. Um, you do some cosmetic work on renaming columns, um, I don't know, casting the right value, um, uh, data types, et cetera. Then you go into intermediary, intermediary is like, Sort of pre-processing before the business uh, logic hits in and the business logic is what we call the march layer so in there you will have fact, fact tables dimension tables um, and this is what the 
world can see, so to say, once you connect your BI tool to your Snowflake, you would mainly expose um, those smart smart models um, to run analysis on top. Okay. Um, I guess we'll take some some other quick ones. Uh, CTEs, are they a best practice? Yes, I believe they are a best practice. We just didn't use them in our example for simplicity. Um, multiple YAML files or combined YAML files, is there a, is there a preference? Um, I would start simple. Um, that's my recommendation every like with everything in DBT, start simple, start with one file. Once you feel pains of um, of managing that one file, you can always move to to multiple files. Um, I find I personally feel like a single YAML um, should be uh, should be sufficient. Um, but of course, I have a lot of data about customers, and for example, for them, they prefer to have individual YAMLs in in most cases. Yeah, that that's another can of worms that I think we can maybe even package into another webinar of Data Vault on DBT. We yeah we... exactly. That would be good content. I think people would be very interested in, in doing that. So um yeah, I think we're 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 already kind of past time. So I, I guess we're we'll leave it here. Um any questions that we might not have gotten to or that we might have missed, we'll we'll try to address um when we share the recording and and file assets in case folks want to follow along. So Last, I want to thank uh, Stefan, and I want to thank all of you for, for attending. This has been great. Um, really appreciate the questions and making it fun and interactive for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure being part of this. Um, hope this is not the last time. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it again. This has been great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.